pale blue dot. Were you, were you ever interested in kind of mental health and, and, and this, this sort of stuff before you were doing your job? No, to be honest with you. Um, no, I had health issues. Yes. <laughs> <Will do. laughs> I had, I had testicular cancer way back in 1983. I was diagnosed when I was in the army. So I had some health issues. Um, but, it wasn't my deal. I, I kind of thought of it as a, as a weakness. And all my jobs have been centered around this macho attitude because I worked at San Quentin. I worked in corrections for, for three years. And I rode a motor with the California Highway Patrol, these macho jobs. And then, of course, I was in the Army. So your mental health didn't really matter. You got to do a job. Yeah. And you do the job and you suck it up and you come back the next day and you do the same thing. It's crazy, isn't it? it? It's a funny, it's a fine line, I think, because I, I think that a lot of the reasons why um, probably more young men as well, but just people in general are struggling at the moment because there's a real kind of crisis in purpose. You know, we, like, like you say, we, we don't have a job to do um, because everything's kind of done for us. You know, we can click Uber Eats and there's our food. We don't have to go out there and hunt and prepare the food, boil the beans. Um, you know, there's a kind of crisis in that we don't have a direction or a purpose, but at the same time, being too focused on that leaves us, um, you know, to the inability to kind of look upon what's going on inside ourselves and stuff as well. So I'm just interested in how this kind of line of work changed your own mental health as well. Right. And exactly what you said. I don't think folks these days are exposed to things as we were years and years and years ago, but a lot of that is good because stuff that you see as in law enforcement or in the military, you know, stuff that, that people shouldn't see because it, it's, it's bad and it sets bad stuff in your head. And, you know, I tell folks, it's like touching a stove. How many times are you going to touch a hot stove when you, before you learn? Probably mm -hmm. just once. But when we look inside of us, I think the things that we see that are really awful, you know, that magnifies and that stays with you because you don't want it to happen again. So that bad stuff, I mean, you may have a hundred good things happen to you, but one thing bad, one bad customer review or something that you had an argument with, that's what you're going to remember. Yes. A lot of times. And it's just kind of the way it is. So yeah, it, that, all this stuff did affect me, um, but I didn't want to acknowledge it. And what I found out after years and years and years of doing this type of work was that I could still go to work and function fine. Once I left the door, because we took our motorcycles home, our police motorcycles, once I went out the door and I'm going to work, it's work mode and I'm fine. But when I came back home is when it really affected me. And that's when I didn't want to do a thing. I would sit in front of a TV. I could do it for days. I didn't want to go down and see my boys, walk the dog. I just wanted to be left alone. I didn't want to go outside and get the mail. Um, and I still have those bad days. It's, it's a battle for, with depression. It's a struggle. But I think what helps me is I know these times will pass. Whereas some folks, they get to the point to where they don't see another day. They can't get past it. Mm. And they don't see a purpose or a reason. And that's when that crisis sets in. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely want to explore that. Um, yeah, j just for those that, that aren't aware, um, Give us, give us the, the brief introduction, mate. You know, what, what kind of led to you um, becoming Kevin Briggs? And you know, maybe we could use this time to talk about your, uh, your work on the bridge and, and everything. Sure. Well, I'm just a traffic cop. That's what it boils down to. <laughs> I, got a, I got a little bit of press. I got a little bit of press and it just blew up. So many, many, many years ago, I was part of an article from the New Yorker magazine, which is famous out here. Then years later... Uh, Yahoo News got a hold of me, and this is around 2012, and wanted to do an interview with me and about my work and on the bridge and such. And I kind of pawned it off. I was a sergeant at the time, and I kind of pawned it off to, to an officer. But they said, no, we don't, we don't want to do it. We want you. So I, I didn't really want to do it, but we did it. I thought it was going to be 10, 15 minutes, and boom, we're good. No, it was five or six hours. It was a long time. And they wanted to go down to the bridge and they put GoPro, GoPros on my motorcycle and we filmed everywhere. Well, that came out 
in December 2012, and I usually took December off. I saved up all my vacation time because I really love Christmas time. <laughs> so I didn't realize all this had taken place. And when I came back to work, I had a ton of, e of email, of regular mail, of phone calls from people wanting me to come and talk about things and present and, and mail thanking me. I, I didn't know any of this. So I was just an interview when I was about my business. So one of the phone calls I got was from the folks at TED, Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And what they do is they pick out 50 people a year from all over, and they bring them all to, now it's Vancouver, British Columbia, and we do uh, a TED Talk. And they give you a certain amount of minutes, a certain amount of time, and you do a TED Talk. And this is a, a huge audience, maybe 1,200 people of wow. generally high-end folks. Um, and I didn't really know, and I, I hate to admit this, but I didn't really know much about TED or a TED Talk. So I asked around before I made a call, and they said, what the hell are you doing? You call them right now. And they hung up on me, so I called them <laughs> up, did this TED Talk. And I think that was my very first talk. So I didn't have the nerves. Like, if I went and did it now, after six years of doing this type of work, I'd probably be a mess. I'd probably be a nightmare up there. Yeah. But I went up and did this TED Talk, and that's when things really took off. And it all stemmed from the work that I did on the Golden Gate Bridge. The bridge is the number one spot in the United States for loss of life to suicide. And a number of reasons why, a lot of theories why most of the time people jump there from the Bay Area, one of the nine Bay Area counties. But we do get folks from around the United States and some from out of country. Wow. And generally we'll lose between 25 and 40 people a year to suicide off that bridge that we know of. And maybe a couple hundred or slightly less folks that we take off for a mental health evaluation, which is just astronomical compared to when you talk to other departments and what they handle. That's a lot of people suffering. Mm. So my work was focused on that for almost a decade. And I handled over probably over 500 cases. I hate to talk numbers because one is enough. But that's a lot of people. So that's when this notoriety kind of came to be. And I would tell folks, I'm, there's other people working on the bridge too. I just happened to get the press on this, but there's, you know, and then I, I was asked to write a book. So I wrote this book called guardian of the golden gate, but I, I'm not too hip with the name because it sounds pretty egotistical and in negotiations, egos have no place, but the publisher has last say on all this. He wants to sell books. Mm -hmm. So I tell folks, you know, there's guardians of Golden Gates all over this world, many of them, whether you're guardian of your house, of your family, of your workplace, wherever that may be. But my work stems from all the work that I did on the Golden Gate Bridge. And now I'm asked to come out and present to folks. Um, by the way, I, last week I went to um, Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland and spoke to the crew and the pilots and everyone of Air Force One which wow. was really cool. Wow. So that's when the president is in one of the two planes that we have, it's called Air Force One. And, and now I have these really cool pictures of me standing next to these planes and they gave me a tour of it. And I got to speak to these folks who are under tremendous amount of pressure to keep these planes up and running. So I've been asked to, I've traveled to Australia all over the world, um, little places like Borneo and, and way in the outback. So, and I, and I found out the hard way that when someone tells you way in the outback, oh yeah, my house is just over here. Yeah, that's <laughs> about an hour away on, on dirt road. So. <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> but that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant, man. Um, you know, one, one thing I encourage firstly, um, everyone to go and see the TED Talk. It, it is one of the most moving TED Talks out there. I really do believe that. I've seen a few of them. And I know you said that, Ego has no place in this sort of stuff. But um, I think that the reason why it is so moving is because your humility shines through, you know, you, this kind of stuff was, was, you know, as you say, almost kind of forced upon you or really, really encouraged. And they saw something in you, mate, you know, and, and your ability, I, I, Bill and I were talking about this when we, after we interviewed you for the first time, and you are one of the best listeners, um, we ever came across, which makes you a terrible guest for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things where it was just, you just have this incredible 
um, ability to give your undivided attention. And it was, it was, it was quite captivating, but look, the, the first thing I wanted to ask, you know, after that introduction was how did it change you as you began to talk to these people that were genuinely considering jumping? I remember you said that, you know, some of them did even after a chat and things like that, like it must've taught you a lot about the human condition. It did. And it taught me a lot about myself and mm -hmm. every single one that I would talk to. Um, and like you said, I did lose uh, some folks and, and it's, it's horrible and breaks your heart, but everyone that would come back over the rail, I would ask, what did I do that helped the situation? And what did I do that hurt the situation? Because I, I believe it's truly important to grow and who better to ask than right then, right there. And they'll tell you, boy, I was so mad when you said this or whatever it may be, or this really helped. So I think it's about improving each and every time with these folks, but I learned a lot about human nature and about just being there for someone, looking them in the eye, how to stand, what to say, what not to say, some things that really get people angry. It's, it's, a lot of it is universal and things that I saw up there. For instance, 99% of the time, folks that were over that rail that were contemplating suicide and were very, very serious about it, felt like they were a burden to their families. If they were taking a, a prescription medicine for a mental illness, they stopped it about a month prior. Mm -hmm. So things like this, there's a lot of commonalities that takes place with those folks. Um, so just, and, and of course, not saying that, oh, people love you and we can fix everything and everything's gonna be fine. Everything not, not to say, and I did all this growing up in this, so to speak. So I learned and I learned to be very truthful and, and brutal even and tell them this is what's gonna happen if you jump. Boom, it's 220 feet down, you're going about 75 miles an hour. Sometimes people live, but then they break a lot of bones and they drown and it's horrible. This is not an easy death. So the brutality of it, because they think that, oh, they're just gonna hit the water and sleep. It's mm -hmm. quite different. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest thing is what you said, is just listening listening to their stories and not making a judgment and saying, I have four things that I, that I always try to stay clear of. And that's you should calm down. I understand things will get better. So instead of you should saying, well, you know what you should have done. Nobody wants to hear that, especially when you're in crisis. Now you're telling me I screwed this all up too, but you know what? Have you tried this would be a much better way of saying it. So, and normalizing what folks are going through, you know, I think anybody, given all those circumstances that you described to me, anybody who would be thinking about suicide would be contemplating it. You've had a very, very rough time, a rough path. So normalizing and validating them, their feelings, um, I think that's, that's how we help folks. Ah, it's brilliant. It's so good. It's so important to, to normalize. It's, it's a perfect word for it. You know, we live in this, you know, relative, well, you know, disconnected society almost you know we live as individuals but it would just be interesting if we were able to develop those skills you know i mean it, it, it is difficult to to talk about things that you're you know you're uncomfortable talking about because you can't figure it out and we want to figure things out and all that sort of stuff but yeah just that ability like hey you know that's i've i've had that thought i've been through a similar situation or that that's people deal with that sort of thing all the time you know did, did you find that after a while people, when you were kind of introducing that normalizing, um, you know, um, vocabulary, all that sort of stuff, did you find that people just felt a lot more reassured or what was the defining factor that helped them? Generally it would. Sometimes it would take some time and sometimes it wouldn't even be me. Now, mind you, prior to our big nightmare here in the States um, of 9-11, 2001, when the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and we had our, our attack, prior to that happening, we had just one officer working down at that Golden Gate Bridge. So if it was me working, we just had eight hour days. I would handle the bridge, all the parking lots, the freeway down into San Francisco, and then also all the way up US 101 through a tunnel, all the way down a hill. So it was a vast area. So the working with suicides was just a portion of what we would do. So it was pretty busy. But if I couldn't make that connection, I would have to call somebody else or I would try to call somebody else, but they may be a while because there was only one officer working down there. So I think that's the other part of this 
is if I can't make that connection with someone, maybe they don't want a white guy, maybe they want a black female, whatever that is, if we can get it, that's what I want to do. And I think that really helps. Now, I know when I'm talking to folks, sometimes you don't have that option, whether you're a parent and a kid, or if you're a very, very small police department, it's just you, whatever it may be, whatever the circumstance. Um, but I believe it's really important on making that connection. And then folks, once they feel comfortable with you and not pushing, trying to build that rapport, we call it trying to influence behavioral change. You can't just go from, hi, I'm Kevin Briggs, to, okay, I want you to come back over the rail, everything's gonna be fine. How do we get to that? So it could be hours, it could be 20 minutes, it could be hours. Things aren't gonna be fine. Mm. Something happened while you're over that rail right now. So just to try to, to comprehend all of that from those folks and be a sounding board for them. Yeah, awesome. Um, that, that's one of the really important things, obviously, in the clinical process and the therapeutic process is, is building rapport. But I, I was wondering if you could kind of um, unpack that a little bit more for, for people that aren't in that, you know, that are trying to reach out to perhaps their family members or their friends and they just feel like for whatever reason there's a, there's a gap and they're not able to um, connect with them. How, how can we build rapport, trust? How can we develop that? I start with... In the States, for real estate, we have location, location, location. That's what they say. Everything is location. <laughs> I say location, list, and listen. So if I'm going to talk to one of my family members about something really high end, maybe a crisis, maybe not, we don't know. I want to first do this where they're comfortable, not where I'm comfortable, because they're the one who's, who's going to be uncomfortable. I'll be uncomfortable, but if they're in crisis, you know, we, we have to get through that. And then list what's been going on. So location, list, talk about, you know what? I've been seeing this. If it's one of my boys who, who you know, my 14-year-old, he's now 18. He was yeah. suicidal. He, uh, he, he's just began UC Davis up there by Sacramento for Division I soccer. So he just got into that. He's just starting yeah. it this week. Oh, man. But he was, he was suicidal, and I missed it. And I'm the one going around the world talking about it. So, but if it was him to set him down where he's comfortable and say, hey, his name's Kevin, like mine, Kevin Jr. You know, I've been seeing a lot of different things. You used to have a lot of friends and now you're hanging out by yourself. You don't want to leave your room. Your grades have been going down. I saw something on a, on a piece of paper talking about death and you're just grumpy all the time and then you're angry. You know, I don't know what's going on, but I'd certainly like to find out. I want to let you know that I'm here for you and could we talk about this? Mm. I'd really like to find out what's going on. No judgment. I want to let you know, I love you. I'm in your corner and I'm here for you. And I think that's a pretty good way to start it. Yeah. Kev, sorry, two seconds, mate. I'll just turn my um, super annoying um, email off. <laughs> sorry about that, mate. <laughs> I didn't hear that thing over here. It actually oh, just, that's good. just went blank for a sec. Oh, just quit out of that bad boy. and We'll get right back into it, my friend. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, mate, here we go. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. I'm, I think, I think where, where it breaks down is a lot of people feel like they almost feel uncomfortable addressing those elephants in the room. You know, you, you're going through a list like that and you're saying, Hey, I've, I've been noticing a lot of changes. And I, I think it's where people get lost is because they, they don't want to make the other person feel uncomfortable, but by doing that, they're almost isolating the other person, you know, from being able to open up as well. So I think that that ability to just be like, Hey, look, I'm noticing, I, I'm, 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 I see that you're here, you know, it, they, they don't feel so, so isolated. Do you find that really helps as well? Absolutely. Cause I think that's what folks do. They think that they're the only ones going through whatever they're going through. Nobody else has, nobody knows, nobody can understand what they're going through. Well, maybe we can't, but I've been through a number of things with head injuries, the, the divorce, all this other stuff. Um, and then if, if somebody talks about, well, you don't know what it, for me, for instance, if somebody says something like, well, you don't know what it's like to have cancer. Well, unfortunately I do, however crappy that is. And now we, however bad it is, we have something in common and commonalities create comfort. Now, whether you're talking about pets, ailments, what it, your job, whatever that may be. So things in common can help too. And that helps build rapport. Mm. 
Okay, so what about for someone that um, finds that the issues that the other person is struggling with don't meet up um, with, with some of the issues that they face as well? So what, what do they kind of struggle with that, um, that commonality approach? Is How do you build the sympathy and the rapport in that way? So in that kind of situation where you don't have much in common, whatever that may be, just by listening to them and validating them and normalizing, you know? validating them going something to the effect of man that sounds really tough you just validated what they went through and man i don't know that's that's really difficult someone who's been through all of that may be thinking about suicide have you been thinking about killing yourself so you went from validating them into normalizing their situation that's awesome and i think yeah i think that's a really good way to do that mm, mm. not not to say you know, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? You're not thinking about something stupid, are you? Because we get nervous. You didn't mean to do it, but we run out of things to say. We don't know how to ask that question. But remember to validate and normalize. And you can look it up on the computer, and it probably says things in there. Um, and, and I think that's a, a really cool way. And once I learned that, it helped a lot also. Yeah. it's it comes A lot of this comes down to just that feeling of, being ashamed of, of who we are. And you, you know, when you, when you, you ask a question like, Hey, you're not thinking about suicide. Are you? It's like, Oh, one more thing I have to feel ashamed about, you know, like, because yes, I have been thinking about that. You know, we get crazy thoughts all the time, but the, just that slight change of phrase can really help bring someone out of their, you know, their fear cocoon or, or can push them right back in even further. Right. And as I found out kind of the hard way in the United States, most states don't we do not require uh, mental health professionals to go through suicide assessment training, which I thought was horrible. When I took my boy, who was 14 at the time, to see a mental health professional, he didn't even ask the question about suicide. He told my boy about it. He looked at Kevin Jr. and goes, well, you're not suicidal, right? That was his way of asking the question. I'm like, what the hell was that? So it was horrible. God damn it. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I know. You know, and I just last week, um, another presentation I went to was at Hartford Healthcare, huge hospital, very, very famous for psychiatric uh, unit and such. And I had a panel with some very, very high end doctors, some really cool suicidologists. And, that, and they even said, they don't, they, you know, they don't even get the training in suicide assessment many, many times. It's a, almost a specialty. That's a shame. I mean, I just, what do you think is going to happen to people if they're, they're pushed to the brink of internal pain for long enough? I just think that you, you, you've got to go through that sort of, I think, I think everyone should go through that training. It should be like CPR. Absolutely. There's a lot of, of good training out there. Um, QPR we have here in the States. I know you guys have, have set an example for us. You do a lot of work out there in Australia. And we have mental health first aid and all these different ones out here. And they're all good and they all have very a little, but they all try to get to the same thing. You know, the root of what's going on and how do we get them some more help or to a mental health professional. So I know there's more and more legislation to for mental health professionals to, to get more training on this. And, and of course, it's all about money generally. But uh, if we don't, we're losing lives. Here in the States, we're losing over 47,000 people a year. I mean, here we lose about a little over 40,000 to traffic accident fatalities, 47,000 to suicide. We're losing more by, to suicide. We have a hell of a lot of work to do as a society. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's, it really sucks, you know, when, when you hear, someone like you talking and saying that just the ability to listen to someone to validate their experience and then to normalize it because so many people go through the same thing and they feel like they're alone in it. You know, that, that, that those skills have to be treated as possibly the most important skill. I mean, they're innate human skills, but the fact that we have to, teach it now consciously says a lot about the way we live right right and you see that it, i can use my street right here how many people are outside most of them, you don't even know your neighbors most of the time they're putting houses closer and closer together but it's requiring both people who live in the house if there's two of you 
or more to work and you get home and you're so exhausted, you come inside, you just want to flap down in front of a TV. And the only time you go outside is when you're leaving or you're putting the garbage out. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of leaning towards this thing now where I talk to folks. And one of the last things I mentioned is where's your front porch. It used to be here anyway. Every house had a front porch. I go up to my grandmother's house, which is way up in Northern California by Mount Shasta. It's a little, little timber town. And now the population is probably about 700. But every single house, every single house has a porch. And years and years and years ago, that's where people would go out to visit because they didn't have the TVs. So people would walk around and they'd go to porch to porch to visit. Well, we don't visit anymore. We're too busy looking at these phones, typing away, nothing like this. Instead of looking eye to eye, face to face, and being there with people. So I ask them, where's your front porch? Mm. It, of course, doesn't have to be a front porch. Where is it? It could be a coffee shop, whatever that is. But where is your front porch? I think we need to get back, back to that. Yeah, we, we do. We, we, God, when, why, why do you think it happened? Like, why, did, why have we become so isolated, Kev? You know, I think it's a lot of it's greed for money. Um, because things are so expensive. When we're looking at where I live, you know, houses are a million dollars, a lot of them. Plus, I mean, and most people don't make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. And and you're just so tired. And of course, then it's the food that we eat uh, isn't made for for making us healthy and, and, and energized. So we get addicted to sugar and then we get ups and downs and up and down. We're cranky and all that. And I'm right there with you because I'll eat the <laughs> hell out of a good candy bar or ice cream or whatever else. Oh, you like it doesn't donuts? last long in this house. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this struggle. And then you don't feel like going working out because you're tired because you work too many hours and you got to work more hours to afford the different things you want. You want a brand new watch, whatever, you know, keeping up with the Jones, as we say, trying to have better stuff or better our kids. Look at how expensive college is nowadays. Whew. So um, yeah, yeah. it's tough. Yeah, I think we, yeah, it's an interesting, it is an interesting topic, you know, talking about kind of like how we live and, you know, you look at, it's almost cliche now because so many people have discussed it, but you, you look at the way we, we used to live, especially when these evolutionary circuits were uh, really coming into being and actualizing, we were very small, lots of tribes, the children were born to the tribe and raised as a collective and, you know, even the Amish, for example, you know, when, when their kids get a little bit too crazy in school, they just throw them out to fish. You know, but <laughs> you know, kind of, we give all the kids Ritalin because they got ADHD. <laughs> well, maybe they're just a bit, maybe they just ate too many Fruit Loops. <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> too many donuts, mate. <laughs> it happens. And we see that. And I think it's the whole combination of, and now there's, there's, I don't know how many channels of television and you go watch, you know, there's the science fiction, comedy, horror, drama. I mean, you got, you got 30 channels for each one. So people like me who like to watch TV, I mean, you, get, you can get suckered in all day watching TV with a boom. And uh, I think we need to get back to that one-on-one -on -one or a community group. And women are still pretty good at it most of mm. the time. Guys, we have a, a tough time with it. Mm. Because I think we still, a lot of us, we want to be that, uh, that loner, that guy that, that can handle everything for that family unit. I don't need any help. I got it covered. If I can't do it, nobody can. Many times we can't, and we need the help. And until we can put down that front, put down that ego, um, there's a lot of people out there that will help, and you just don't realize it. But once you get serious and go, hey, I got some stuff, and... I will tell you, if you're the one that's going to get talked to, if somebody says, Kevin, can I talk to you for a while? This is going on. Please don't start telling them what they should have done. Shut your mouth and listen. Nobody likes that. And don't compare your situations. There's a difference between having a commonality and comparing it. If they're telling me really some bad, some bad stuff that's been going on with them, and you're going to say, well, yeah, I had all this stuff. And let me tell you all about me and interrupt their story and what they're telling you just defeated the whole purpose of that individual breaking down to you. Don't compare situations. Mm, that's such a good point. Yeah. When I was on the bridge, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about the things that have happened to me with depression and stents in the heart and all the, you know, brain issues, all this other stuff, because it wasn't about me. And I don't want that. I'm not learning anything when I'm talking. 
I want to hear what's going on with them. Now, if they say something, you know what it's like. I've had all these concussions. Well, let me tell you, I, I can a little bit because I had this. Well, what happened to you? And now I can tell them or we can talk about stories. But the more they're talking, they're venting, which we know is huge. And we're gathering information, which helps us. So let them talk. Yes. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. You, you, I think you hit a really good point there with the, when they're talking, they're venting, you know, which is they're externalizing, they're detaching themselves from the story that they've identified themselves as. And the more they do that, the more they kind of work through it and see that it's a story. It's, it's not, it's thoughts. It's, it's not who they are. It's, it's maybe perhaps what's been going on and their perspectives but it's not who they are. Absolutely. Yes. And, and you got it. Right. So I think that I say two things, listen to understand and lean in, lean into them. And, and if I could offer one more piece of advice, no barriers, no desks in between you, no tables come around. And then, I mean, these are for these high end conversations where it, somebody's really, really hurting. Don't get that barrier, that safety zone. Come out with them. I think those three can, can really help out. And, and you're going to help people. Um, you know, and, and that's what's the biggest thing that we can do for folks and helping them out like that. Mm. Being there I can't think them. of anything better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the, the closest that you will get, now mind you, if they are suicidal, but they tell you, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody something. I'm not keeping a secret. I want you around. If you're actively suicidal, yeah, you know, don't worry about me. In two days, I'm going to be fine. Well, instead of leaving like that, what do you mean you're going to be fine? Don't worry about me. I got everything lined up. I'm going to be fine. And you get them to feel that they're going to be suicidal. We need to get you help now. Now, in America, whether that's calling 911 for law enforcement to come and talk to you, I don't care what it is. They're going to be madder than hell. They may talk, not talk to you for some time, but they're still there. And I will almost guarantee that later on you're going to be better uh, because of that. They're going to thank you. Thank you. I was in a very, very dark place. You're the only one that talked to me and got me out of that. Yeah, it sucked. I had to go to the psychiatric unit for an hour, for three days, for a week, whatever it was. But I'm feeling much better. I got the help that I needed that I didn't want to acknowledge. You're the only one that pulled me through this. I hated you for, for a while. But thank you. You're the best. Yeah. Yeah, Kev, that's a great uh, segue. I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, maybe one or two of the more uh, memorable or overwhelming experiences that you had during the time on the bridge. Um, one of the best ones I had is if you've seen the picture of the African-American man standing on the other side of the rail, that was in the TED Talk. Yep. And that was Kevin Berthea. And he was actually on the sidewalk when I received a call about him. Um, and I received a call of a man on the sidewalk holding a cell phone, talking to a loved one. And that loved one used another phone to call the police. So I got the description and everything and started working my way down the sidewalk on my motorcycle. And as I neared the North Tower, I see the description of him. It looks like him. I go, that's probably him. I stop about 50 feet away. And as I'm getting off of my motorcycle, he looks my direction and he goes and jumps over the rail, four foot rail. And as he's jumping, I yelled something to him, but he, he caught himself. He reached out and caught the rail, swung around, wham, slammed into the rail. And on the other side of that rail is not the big I beam that parallels the bridge because around the two towers at ends, you're not going to have that metal bending around there, but it's just this little bitty pipe some very small pipe that goes around there. So he landed on that pipe. It's like miracle number one. How does someone just leap over this rail, then able to grab it, fall down, boom, slam into the rail and still there. Oh my God. There's nothing on the other side of that, 220 feet down. So I walked up and I could see his white t-shirt through the, the metal eye beams there of the rail. So I knew he was still hanging on. And I started talking to him, and I just introduced myself as Kevin. Go, hey, I'm, I'm Kevin. Is it okay if I come up and talk with you for a while? I want their permission. I think it's, it really sets a good tone that rather than just walk up like law enforcement. And, you know, our job is to take charge and handle situations and calm the chaos. 
Well, I want his permission because I think it really sets a good tone to come up with, wow, this guy wants to talk to me and is asking me? Nobody's done that. But he didn't want anything to do with me. He wanted nothing to do with me. He goes, you come one step closer and I'm jumping. And he was maddered in hell. And this went on for some time. Wow. Before little by little, he allowed me to come up and speak with him. And then for the majority of the time, I was kneeling down or almost kneeling down. So our faces would be closer together and, and the same. I don't want to be above him. I don't want to be talking down to someone because that's what I was be doing, talking down to them. I don't want to be equal. I want everything equal. So that's what I did. And I do it. Man, I just want to find out what's been going on. What has been happening that you felt you had to come over today to this bridge and go over this rail? I just want to find out and get some information. Man, I want you to let you know that I'm here for you. I'm not going to leave. If you want to talk, I want to sit here and listen. And eventually he started talking to me. Uh, and just kept talking and, and, and speaking and went on for over 90 minutes with him speaking. And he talked about um, the major points were he was adopted. His birth mother didn't want anything to do with him. That's a big one. Wow. And his adopted family loved him very much. But when he was around 13 years old, his family divorced. And it wasn't explained to him why. He had nothing to do with it, but he thought he broke up this family unit. It was him that did it, but it wasn't. It was just never explained to him. And he did suffer from a mental illness and was supposed to be taking some medications, and he had stopped taking the medications some time prior. Uh, and he suffered a lot, but as long as he kept busy, he was good. So he just kept busy as he, as he could possibly do. Played six different sports all through school and high school. But at night is when things really got bad. When he laid his head down on that pillow, that's when it really went bad for him and, and thoughts were racing through his head. It was just very, very tough. So when he got out of high school and did some college, and then he thought, you know what? I want to start a family. Things will get better if I start a family. So he started a family, um, had a baby, but the baby was born two months premature. So he thought, boy, I really screwed this one up. What, what did I do? to make this baby come out early and in poor health. So the baby had to stay in the hospital uh, for a while, for a couple of months. And when the baby was able to come home, so did a huge hospital bill for over $200,000. And on top of all this, he was laid off with his job. So now he can't protect or help his family. So everything was going downhill. He thinks to himself that I can't do anything right. So he said, you know what? I'm just going to cash it in. I I've, I've, can't do anything right. I'm no good. Mm -hmm. Finds his way up to the bridge. Never been there before. And that's where we meet. So as we were speaking about this, and I learned about his child, who's, who was very, very young, and had a birthday coming up in a bit. Well, I asked him. I started focusing on that because where would most of us, where would our thoughts be for, for all of this would be our, with our child? And I said, well, instead of focusing on how could you do this to your child? I went more with, well, how do you think your child's going to feel when she grows up? Mm. And every anniversary date for this is going to be just hell for her. And do you know that kids have a higher rate of suicide if they lose a parent? Mm. That made it focused on her more. And then I went silent for a while and let him think about all this. And he finally he said, you know what? I'm going to come back over. And it was mainly, he told me, I asked him when he came back over, I congratulated him. Um, and he said it was talking about focusing on his child. But I asked him, what did I do that was good, that really helped the situation? And what did I do that sucked, that hurt this, and you were angry? He goes, no. He goes, you listened to me. You let me speak, and you listened. That's all this guy was looking for. So when I talked to folks, I said, why does it take this stage four cancer of a bridge to get people to listen to us? Why can't we do it right here, right now? That's the biggest thing. It's a courageous conversation. It's a crappy conversation. But if we don't do it, we're going to lose more and more people. God, it's it just, it's, 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 it's such overwhelming stories, mate. Um, it just makes you think of, you're exactly right. The, the stage four cancer of the bridge, like could that have been avoided if 
someone just gave him a minute, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, I'm, I'm not putting the blame on his parents whatsoever, but I'm always trying to learn from these conversations, you know, as to how when Siobhan and I, um, you know, my, my partner Siobhan and I, um, you know, have children, how I could do that. And I guess my, my takeaway from that was if we were ever to break up in that situation, it would just be, Hey, I need you to know that, you know, this, this isn't your fault. This is a situation between your mum and I, and um, just developing those skills. Yes. And it's stuff that we generally want to avoid. We, who likes conflict? Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially verbal conflict, not war. There's some guys that, Hey, they're all into that, whatever you want to be. But when it comes to domestic stuff like this, you know, it's really tough. It takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot to say what's going on with us. If you're a very good listener, it pulls a lot out of you because you're having to listen to all of this and take this in and try to get a proper response. Um, if a response is needed. So it's a brutal, you're, you're both tired and you just want to go home and take a nap after, you know, eat some donuts, <laughs> help someone. That's my counselors. I don't know how you guys do it, but I, I, I did this four to six times a month. Counselors are doing it multiple times every day. I go, I don't have the energy. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also the vicarious trauma and things that can happen in compassion fatigue because you're hearing these stories all the time and you're right there and you're experiencing that even though you may have not been at that brutal rape when you're hearing about it you're getting every little thing about it and it's in your head and you have these images and you could see that going on and that takes a heavy toll. So I talk to mental health professionals about that. What are you doing? Because that is trauma. And, and it can take a heavy, heavy toll. So instead of doing this every single day, you know, how do you get time off? And how do you get that release from those things and do something else? And knowing that what you're doing is for the greater good. But we still need to see what we can do to alleviate what you may be going through as mental health professionals. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So um, what worked for you? You know, um, hanging out and riding the motorcycle was, was a lot of fun. And then I have a little chihuahua that really helped me. Oh, Actually, yeah. She was in there. Hey, she was on your bed just before. There you go. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So that's Bella. So, and dogs are known. If you like dogs, you know, petting them for 10 minutes a day takes so much stress out of you and helps get rid of that cortisol. Exercise we know is big for getting rid of cortisol. What are we doing, I ask folks? What are you doing to help with you? Because sometimes we were about so many people all the time. Now that both my boys are driving, I'm always worried about car accidents. We just lost a very close friend last week because he did something not smart and he went in a 20, 30 mile an hour zone. He went 70 miles an hour hit a retaining wall and, and he got killed. He died. Um, and it just broke the hearts of this whole community here. I mean, it just a, a very foolish act, but still the guy is gone very close with my youngest boy, just six. It was his birthday, 16 years old, a lot of trauma in that family now and for this whole community. So these things, you know, we need to come together as one and, and be able to talk openly about them and our feelings. And, and those yeah. Things, so. I think uh, trauma is a really uh, contentious um, you know, topic in this day and age, you know, and I think um, the way you said it before was, was really important, for, especially for the listeners that, you know, trauma is, is subjective. You know, obviously you didn't use those words specifically, but you said, you know, when you're listening to these people talk about these horrendous events, it's traumatizing for you and trauma in a sense that it's creating this, you know, uncomfortable feeling that could kind of influence you in the future. And I say this, you know, to, to people that I work with that trauma is, is basically something that was, that happened to you that was really scary that led you to believe that you were inadequate in some way, shape or form. And the sad thing is, you know, with the, uh, the guy you mentioned before is that, you know, his parent, his parents divorcing and his limiting belief arising from that experience was, Oh, it was my fault. And that kind of shame has, sounds like it just drove his life car up until up until when you met him right right and if you have a few of those types of circumstances um it's just brutal on you 
it really can take a toll unless you have an outlet or you are seeking therapy, what, whatever that may be. But I'd like to let folks know, you know, there's people out there that can help you. And if it gets down to it, you need to call a crisis line. I know you folks have them there. We have them here. That's a good start. But I think as, as friends and whatever you have with folks, if it could start with us and start at home, start in the community, I think we have a much better chance of helping folks before they even consider talking about suicide or something like that. And of course, not everyone's suicidal. Maybe they're just going through a very, very tough time. But to know that you don't have to do this alone. And I'm there for you. You can call me 24 hours a day. You know, maybe I can't pick up right then, but I certainly will call you back as soon as I can. So there's a, there's a lot of things that we can do. Yeah. And I think a rhetoric that's been really important for me to, to push lately is that it can get so much better. Like you, you can there, you know, we know that, you know, there are places out there that can then help. And these conversations, God, there's a reason why I love doing this podcast because I get to speak to people like you, mate, but you know, you're, as you would know, uh, just from your own experience, you know, mental health, it can really improve. You, you start putting these things in, in your life, these conversations and be willing to be open to change. And you're, you can get so much better, you know, that there truly is light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And it's what a lot of it is, is things that we can control. Instead of watching TV three hours a day, why don't we take a meditation class? Mm. Why don't we try a yoga class? Finger painting, ceramics, something, something that gets you moving. Um, and I never thought about meditation. I always thought it was a joke until yeah. my heart issues. And I said, man, you better be doing something. So I tried, I went through this kind of extensive long course uh, TM transcendental meditation. Oh yeah. And, and I put away my type A conservative cop. I went into it with an open mind and it was really, really cool. And as law enforcement, uh, just to give you an example, we don't shut our eyes around people. You just don't, you just, everybody's a suspect, man. You know, <laughs> so you, don't, you don't turn your back. You don't close your eyes. Yeah. The best, um, deals that I have had, or when I was in a room down in Sausalito with maybe eight to 10 other people, these meditations where I didn't, I didn't know their first name. I couldn't tell you anything about them. And we're almost face to face, just sitting across from each other. And we do these meditations for half an hour and, and I would close my eyes half an hour. And these were the best meditations I had I felt happy and everything getting out. And, and I had no clue about these people. So just the time and place to be able to open up. And this isn't, we're not talking, but, just to open up my mind and my thoughts and do this meditation. Um, it really says something about being open and, and wanting to make a change. Mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that uh, people that, that are really struggling in life, is it, it's not necessarily that they don't want to make a change. Cause I'm sure that, you know, if they knew that things could improve, they, they, they could, they would want to, but they almost just kind of don't know where to start. Like even the idea of going to a meditation class just seems like beyond for them. Right. Some people don't. And I'll tell you, there's still days that I don't want to go outside and it happens yeah. kind of frequently to be honest with you. It sucks. I just feel uncomfortable. Maybe it's the anxiety and it's weird because I can get on stage and talk to thousands of people. No problem. But once yeah. I'm off stage, I'm generally in my room ordering food and watching sci-fi channel. So <laughs> I love it. Weird thing. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but I believe in it. And so that's, that's part of the deal. So I understand that, but to force yourself out, or maybe there's a different way. Maybe there's something online you can do. I know there's mental health classes that you can do. They're trying to get the cognitive behavioral therapy. I know that's online now for folks. Um, and, and I've read some reports where it, it does well because folks are more comfortable at home and things. So maybe there's something like that. There's a lot of different ways and avenues to approach things. Mm. And maybe just going out and walking out to your mailbox is all you can do today. Okay. Maybe the next day we walk past that mailbox 30 feet and we walk back. It starts out slow and we just increase that. We got to push yeah. ourselves a little bit. You want to get better? You, you got to push yourself a little bit. 
Yeah, it, it's it's um it's incremental changes, isn't it? I think we all sometimes yes. we want to try to fix all our problems in one day, but you know, if you to use a simple analogy, you've never been to the gym before, first time you walk into the gym, it's probably unlikely that you're going to be able to squat 200 kilos. You know, the same way, it's probably going to be unlikely that if you you're real in a really bad position, you're very anxious today. You know, you, you're going to do all your meditation, your journaling, you're going to speak to someone. You're not going to be fixed tomorrow, but you'll be 3% better. And then it's about trying to find that um, reason to, to keep going, to keep going, you know. Yes. I was wondering if you could kind of explore that. Like, what, what could you say to someone that's um, on the journey but is struggling to continue their mental health development? And it takes time. How many years did it take to get to where you're at now? with how you're feeling. Generally years and years and years and years, maybe decades. So there is no quick fix. You know, um, it's going to take time and it's going to take work and it's going to take effort. But if we can, um, some people would say, you yeah, have to almost punish yourself and go through the gym and go through the world and fight it and just got to fight it and do it. I'm, I'm kind of disagree with that. If you're punishing yourself, you're not going to want to come back and do it again. Mm. I would look at it a little different as getting out and exploring that. Hey, today I did five reps at 75 pounds. So this is my goal. I'm going to, I'm going to beat that by this time. And at least I can say, you know what? I made it to the gym today mm. because last week I, only, I was only able to go once. I just couldn't have any to this week. I went twice celebrate the, the small accomplishments because many times mm. they're not small. They're absolutely huge. If you haven't been at the gym in years, and all of a sudden, you go on one, one time this week, maybe you make it twice the next week, and, and just be realistic. If you know because you're very busy and you have obligations at work and at home that you can only make time three times a week, then make time for three times a week. That's better than zero. Yeah, you, you got to be realistic, don't you? That's a good point. I mean, for someone that's uh, agoraphobic, get, getting to the gym and then that being too much and going home is, is an incredible win. Just getting out of your room is an incredible win. We, we tend to focus on the negative, us human beings, you know, um, us threat detectors. But um, we've got to kind of realise that we, uh, we're, doing, we're doing okay. Kev, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, mate, kind of move to, towards the end now, but that one defining lesson that you learnt from, from all your time on the bridge, I, I think we kind of already touched on the answer, but I wonder if you could say it explicitly. What, what's that one lesson that you took away from all those years? You know, I would say what pops into my head, just gut wrist would be make a connection. Don't just walk by and think everything's okay. We walk by our family members and our friends. We sit down with them. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm great. How are you? Good. And then we, and then we may even have coffee for an hour, but we don't dwell on things. And we're talking all politics and religion or whatever it may be, or what, you know, a lot of negative things that we don't like or something. But to really sit down and go, you know what, how, how are you doing? Everything going okay? Just want to check. I may not have seen a thing. I just, just really want to check just to find out. Mm. And if you are seeing stuff, don't be afraid to have that, that courageous conversation. Uh, it is so important. It is so important. And just do a one-on-one. -on -one. Don't, don't get this three people on one person because you feel better and, and it's a, such a tough thing to do. I need support for me to have this conversation. Yeah. You can do it. You can do it. We all can do it. It's tough. It's not easy. But you're gonna, you will definitely be helping someone, even if they have nothing wrong. They're going to know, man, that guy really cares. Your mm -hmm. bond is going to be greater or if everything in their life is going wrong and they're actively suicidal, they're going to think you're the one that they can go to for help. Mm. Either way, you're not going to, there's no losing to this conversation. It's a matter of, of building on it. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome, man. That's so good. You're, you're not going to say the wrong thing because even just by saying something, you're building a connection. I think that's where people get really get lost. You know, they're, they're like, what if I say the wrong thing and that pushes them even further? It's like, hey, just by you trying to say something is not doing the wrong thing. Right. Exactly. You got it. Just being there. Yeah. And a lot of times, just not even saying anything. 
just sitting there with someone. And I've actually done that. I've had it done to me to where uh, just by being close to someone, you don't have to be touching or whatever else. There's that connection. Mm. Um, and, it, and it works and it helps. It really does. Yeah. You know, my, my um, most important love language is physical touch. So I make sure that, um, you know, when Trevon's sitting next to me, I just like have my hand on her lap or whatever it is. Just for some reason that just, it just makes me know that she's around. That's very strange, but you're yeah, right, mate. That, that connection. connection. Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it takes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah thank you. you got it. <laughs> I love it. Kev, what's, um, what's coming up for you, mate? Um, you got some events happening next couple of months. Yes. I'm leaving on Thursday for Montana for 10 days. And then I'm coming back to California for one day and then over to Kansas city and then South Dakota. Um, then I'm back for a couple of weeks. I'm going to, to Florida and a, a few other events. So it's, it's been fairly busy and, and it's going to remain. So I'm trying to have just a few things lined up for next year. So I know love to get out there and, and talk with the folks. Um, it's a lot of fun. And I always try to tailor everything to them. If it's mental health professionals, I'm talking about the compassion fatigue and how we can do that and how they can become better at their craft and, and that. And, uh, I'm going to be speaking, which is a little unusual, six to eighth graders in Montana. Mm. And they worry me. Kids worry me. I started <laughs> working at the local schools in my area. I go to, oh. when, I'm not, when I'm not traveling, I do some mentorship at 11 uh, schools in my town. And I will tell you, kindergartners scare the hell out of me. Yeah. I go to high schools, whatever else, kindergartners, oh boy, watch out. They are brutal. <laughs> yeah. They won't take any shit, mate. <laughs> they won't, but they'll give it too. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> oh, Kev, it's been, um, it's been so good to chat, man. Thanks so much for your time again. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's awesome. And um, I'm sure this won't be the last time, my friend. It'd be good to check in, um, you know, down the next, next couple of months, six months, a year. We'll see where Great. each other are at and have another, have another convo. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And if you get out to the States, you got to let me know. Yes. We've got to have more donuts together. There we go. <laughs> we'll take a picture and a video of it. Yes, that's exactly right. Show folks, it's okay once in a while. Yes, that's right. We're doing it. <laughs> there you go. All right, All right brother. All right. Thank you. Man. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate man. it. Soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.